All right, we're back this week for a editor podcast without one of the key members on injured reserve, Catherine Lamb. Catherine's recovering from a sore throat. Uh, hopefully, Catherine, if you're listening, you're doing okay. And we'll be back on the next podcast. But we do have Chris Albrecht and Jen Marston. Hey, guys, how you doing? What's up, Mike? Good. Oh, I'm excited. Uh, we're just less than two weeks out uh, from Smart Kid to Summit. We'll go into that a little bit. But like, as always, when the fall comes around, news just seems to come at a fierce pace. And it's no different this year. Uh, Jen, you, you wrote about Fat Burger, which is kind of a crazy thing, turning some of their Los Angeles, Los Angeles stores into ghost kitchens for its sister brand. I thought that was really interesting. Um, tell us a little bit about that story. So Fat Burger, for those who aren't aware, is a Southern California-based uh, quick service restaurant. They do, uh, as the name suggests, really fat burgers. Um, so, But they are owned by Fat Brands, who has a number of different restaurant chains under its umbrella. And Fat Brands owns a restaurant called Hurricane Grill and Wings, which is more on the East Coast, like Florida and New York. Uh, but what they're doing is using Fat Burger locations in Los Angeles to basically double as ghost kitchens for this uh, Hurricane Grill and Wings menu. So, and it's it's delivery only, which I think is really interesting. So. If you go onto Grubhub or Postmates or one of the usual third-party delivery sites, you can access, uh, and you have to be in Los Angeles, uh, you can access the Hurricane Grill and Wings menu from those sites and get their food delivered to you, which I think it's an interesting uh, interesting tactic because it's, it's exposing... Uh, you know, say you've got someone who's a fan of Fat Burger. Well, they would probably, if they're out on the West Coast, never have an opportunity to experience some of these other brands that Fat Burger owns and these other restaurants. So this is sort of a super cost-effective way for Fat Brands to kind of expose customers to the entire portfolio without having to go and build full-on brick-and-mortar restaurants with dining rooms in, across the country. Um, and they, they did say that they wanted to start doing this sort of ghost kitchens uh, <clears throat> for one brand in the kitchen of another, uh, just with all of their restaurant chains in the future. So I think this is, I mean, this is the first time I've seen something like this, but it, it just thinking about it now, it just kind of seems like a no brainer. And I feel like this is definitely something we're going to be needing to keep an eye on in the future uh, because obviously there's plenty of huge restaurant companies that own multiple different brands. So this could potentially be a big area to watch with ghost kitchens. I agree. I mean, I think there's a huge amount of uh, capital CapEx and, and fixed investment into these restaurant chains and particularly in their abilities to create food. And if you, like you said, Jen, if you're one of these big conglomerates with lots of different brands why not just leverage it and it looks like the the fat burger kitchens are going to be double do, do doing double duty mm -hmm. um yeah uh so I, I think it makes sense at the same time you're just seeing so much of this ghost kitchen virtual kitchen heat um i think there's been a couple thing pieces around uh travis clonic and like his investments over the past week or two so um, and getting big valuations. So it seems like everyone's turning their attention to this space. And Kitchen United just raised $40 million. $40 million. $40 million. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. In some ways, I think, I always wonder, like, it's sometimes when you're watching Shark Tank and you see this, like, invention for, like, something really obvious, you go, why didn't I think of that? I feel like that's the case with, like, just ghost kitchens. Like, why didn't, why didn't we think of this sooner? Because, like, it's really expensive to build physical retail locations and kitchens. And if you're one of these big companies with a big network of them, why wouldn't you think of doing this sooner? Right. Well, I think a lot of, I mean, I don't think, I know. Um, <laughs> a lot of the growth with these ghost kitchens is delivery. And, right. you know, the Fat Burger News case in point, I mean, the its sister restaurant, the Hurricane, Gr uh, Hurricane Wings and Grill, is only available through delivery. You can't walk into a fat burger and say, I want to order off the hurricane menu. So I think it's definitely um, just, I mean, I would go as far as to say delivery is basically table stakes. Now we say that all the time around here. Um, are we going to hit a point where for at least these large restaurant companies with multiple chain restaurants is 
the ghost kitchen at some point also going to become, you know, the norm, basically. Yeah, you make a great point in that delivery and the build out of that option and the maturation of it, the rapid adoption of it by consumers really was kind of this uh, lever that was pulled that led to basically a bunch of cascading changes in the restaurant industry. I mean, people are changing with the way they're designing restaurants now. You have celebrity chefs like Mocha Voltaggio building in food delivery into their restaurants. And then uh, to your point, I mean, really this type of development like a fat burger um, really was ne- necessitate. I mean, it took food delivery to really kind of necessitate them th- rethinking their business model and their network of kitchens to to essentially do this type of thing. So I think you make a great point there. Well, I think it's also just think about just the prevalence of app based, yep. you know, Grubhub and DoorDash reaching critical mass. And then, you know, what's fascinating to me is the idea that they have all this data on what people are searching for and, you know, the ability to go in and then, uh, you know, create virtual restaurants that don't exist anywhere um, creates a whole other layer of it. Right. So we're just at this real interesting sweet spot where there's enough penetration of the third party delivery services. DoorDash is in all 50 states right now. Everybody has a mobile phone. And how now do you re-architect or re rework your your restaurant to to pardon me take advantage of the new style of eating as it were? Mm-hmm. Speaking of changing the game, Chris, you're you've been writing about how uh, stadiums are changing what they have in them with regards to food tech and how they're kind of on the leading edge. Uh, yeah. Of, how do you, I don't like that segue? By the way, is that okay? It's pretty great. Every anytime you can work the game <laughs> pun in, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, uh, I like it. Uh, batter up. I, I, I had to pat myself on the back for that. Yeah, one that was a home run segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, Jen has been reporting on this as well. You know, it, what sort of tipped it off was uh, so there was an announcement that went out today Zippin, which does uh, cashierless checkout for convenience stores. Uh, is putting a cashierless checkout convenience store inside the Golden One Center in Sacramento. And my first thought was like, well, duh, why haven't why haven't there ever been convenience stores in stadiums already? You know, they're small. They carry a lot of stuff. But obviously a line would form in the small area and that would be real annoying. But the idea of having checkout line and not having a checkout line where you just walk in, you scan your phone, walk in, grab what you want and leave, like that's pretty amazing and also perfect for – like a baseball game where you don't want to miss a lot and you want to just, you want to grab a soda, but you don't want to stand in line. And then you, you know, you're standing there and people are gawking at the, at the menu, trying to figure out what they want to get. Right. You know, it's, it's this idea uh, of a convenience store uh, seems really smart. And I think we'll see a bunch of them, but that's also just the latest idea, right? Like the mile high stadium opened up a different convenience store and they didn't use cashierless checkout. Uh, they used uh, sort of this company called Mastion creates a computer vision checkout thing where you just basically set all your stuff on this pad and then it looks and sees what all the ingredients, what everything you're buying and then audit gives you an automated total and you can pay right there. But this also follows like those are front of the house things. And in the back of the house, you see Flippy was employed at Dodger Stadium and Yankee Stadium actually are two places to watch. Right. Because Dodger Stadium has Flippy right. and Postmates Dodger and Flippy Postmates, I believe. Which one? Uh, Dodger Stadium. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Dodger Stadium has Flippy making tater tots and chicken tenders. Right. That's a robotic arm that just stands in front of a hot fryer and cooks up tater tots throughout the game. Uh, And um, and Postmates pickup, which Jen wrote about last week, which is where you can order food from your seat and then go to the Postmates pickup line and grab it. And you don't want to stand in line. That's pretty great. So all these things, stadiums are really good places to test these things out because they involve a lot of people uh, you know, high traffic, high volume areas and people, you know, it's not a place where people are trying to really individuate their food. They're not trying to personalize it so much. They're trying to just get something and get back to the game. Right. Yep. Right. And, and what, after all, are stadiums than entertainment places? It's where, you know, it's still a little bit of P.T. Barnum and kind of a circus-like environment. And I still feel like we're in that stage of some of this technology where it is kind of like about entertainment. Like, I feel like robotic food dispensers oftentimes are part of part of the show and that's the phase we're in so it makes a lot of sense that stadiums would be a logical place and secondly just to your point chris you want to get back to watch the game and, and just getting people through faster and getting people back in their seats uh i think if technology can help that i think everyone's happier because you're spending a lot of money you're spending hundreds of dollars to go to the stadium nowadays for an outing 
And do you want to stand in line for 20 minutes for a hamburger? Well, I, I think stadiums, too, you, you kind of have a captive audience as well, which is one of the reasons that, you know, something like um, Postmates works so well is because they would never, you know, as a, as a food delivery service, they would never be able to reach this group of people um, traditionally with delivery because you can't get outside food or drink brought into a stadium. So set up a pickup station, you know, that's more exposure to Postmates, but, it, you know, as you guys have said, it's it's a faster way to get concessions as well. And then I, I think, uh, was it last year, um, <clears throat> Seattle, the uh, Seahawks Stadium. What's the name of that one? Uh, who knows? Uh, CenturyLink. CenturyLink. Is it CenturyLink. Field. Wait, which one is it now? Is it T-Mobile or CenturyLink? I think it's CenturyLink. I think the Mariner Stadium changed. Oh, uh, to team, oh right, right. Yeah, to T-Mobile. Well, they had clear in there uh, to so you could scan your thumbprint to get a beer as well, um, which, you know, again, a, I think a stadium is a pretty uh, – like why wouldn't you want to try that? As Mike said, part of the – you know, part of concessions at sports games is that they're entertaining. So why not try and make them more entertaining by testing out – all these different technologies. Well, I think also introducing people like right now, there are a limited number of cashierless checkout stores, right? And unless you work downtown in Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles uh, or New York or, you know, some major metropolitan area, you're not going to really bump into an Amazon Go. And for Zippin, this really, not only for the company Zippin, but also just the idea of cashierless checkout really brings it to a mass audience might not be able, who might not encounter it otherwise, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think you would just, you would travel into uh, a downtown core just to go to Amazon Go. I mean, we all have because we write about it, but like, if you're just the average person living in the suburbs, you know, why you wouldn't do that. But if you're at the store, if you're at a game, then like, hey, this is actually really convenient or I hate it or what's going on or whatever. Like it still exposes people to it uh, in a way that they probably wouldn't normally come across. It mm-hmm. It makes a lot of sense. I'm just waiting for the drone delivered hot dogs. Um, I'm sure that's next, Chris. Um, but uh, I'm excited for that development. Uh Speaking of technology and innovation and, and whether and whether or not it makes our eyes better, one of the, the interesting stories that uh, touched on the Connected Kitchen this week was an article by Joe Ray. Uh, he wrote friend of the Spoon, for, Joe Friend Ray. of the Spoon, Friend of the Smart Kitchen Summit. I love Joe's writing. He's probably my favorite kitchen gadget reviewer. He wrote an article said, the Smart Kitchen is very stupid, uh, using a, a, a headline convention that we've used, seen him uh, quite a few times around Smart Home and Smart TV. <laughs> I think editors just find it too easy, quite honestly. <laughs> but in his post, he, he made the, uh, some points basically about how connected products in the kitchen aren't ready for his prime time. He hasn't really found that they're all that useful. And I have some thoughts on this, but Chris, you wrote an article in response to this, so I'd let you kind of uh, – uh, let you go first. Well, I, I really do want to find out your thoughts because I think people have heard my thoughts already enough <laughs> on it. But for me, I think it just boiled down to this. Again, like, love Joe Ray. He's great. His writing is amazing. His reviews are bar none, right? Like, so he's not a dumb dumb. Um, and I think what there's this sort of this idea of he's probably a really good cook. And from his writing, you can tell he's a really good cook. He knows his way around meats. He knows his way, you know, how to make things and sauces and all of that stuff. And I don't. And so having a June oven uh, or a Traeger Wi-Fi grill, like those, my wife travels a lot. So I wind up cooking meals for myself and my son and I'm a horrible cook. But with the June, I can pop in a cod or a salmon or a chicken or whatever, and it cooks it for me and it comes out great. And I love that. And I made, I've never made ribs before because I was like, oh man, that just takes hours and I don't have the patience. But with the Traeger grill, I was like, oh, I can just pull out my phone and make sure it's still at temperature. And there were still some things I had to do and some some kinks that still need to be worked out with the Traeger. But for the most part, I was able to make ribs for the first time and it wasn't daunting. It was like the smarts, the connected nature of it really helped me out. But that's my point. I'm just not a good cook. So I like that kind of <laughs> stuff. But Mike... I'm curious. I know you've got thoughts and I want to hear them. Line them Me up. Too. <laughs> well, I think in some ways he argued against his headline, right? I mean, he pointed out some products that actually were essentially interesting new innovations over the past few years. He talked about the Thermomix. He talked about the Instant Pot. Um, so I, I tend to agree with them there in, in that respect. Um, 
But I would say that like he focused very much on the connectivity component of it and like whether or not um, a product is better if you have an app to turn it on or off. Um, I will say this. I think that software uh, in the kitchen uh, and around connected products will ultimately change the game because I think what it does is make some product – you know when you drive a car off the lot and it instantly depreciates? Um, <laughs> wait, wait looking what? At your, <laughs> look at your, looking at your June and, and all the new features you have on that since you bought it, Chris, like it clearly makes – uh, a, a completely different like model for appliance makers. If you have an appliance that actually adds features a year or two down the the line, is actually really interesting. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. Like June keeps adding cook programs for all different kinds of things. I also think he's very narrowly focused on the cooking component of it, which I think is, is slowly improving. We have things like the Thermomix, the TM6 is it looks like a for all purposes and the looks it looks like a pretty amazing new kind of connected kitchen appliance. Um, I think the Instant Pot is, while fairly simply, simple, like it's kind of a rethink of like the pressure cooker. It makes it, you know, easier to use. But but I think focusing so narrowly on cooking for a guy who's largely been a restaurant critic and a, an appliance critic, like it, I think he's a critic, right? I think, but if you stand back and for people like us, Chris, it makes sense, like who don't spend as much time cooking, um, I think that's important. But also, Think about all the ways in which we can use technologies to do things like reduce food waste. Um, exactly, we haven't even talked about that. He didn't talk about that. That's exactly um, what I was thinking, actually. Um, there's so much to be done in this space. I mean, you have guys like Amazon filing patents to put in, like, essentially electronic noses in the refrigerator. But but 40% of the food is in is, that is thrown out is thrown out of the consumer kitchen. If we can use technology to somehow reduce that, um, I think that's huge. Um and I just think just generally looking forward, I, I think we're, we definitely are in the second or third inning, but this, all this stuff is going to get better. So, um, so I told I had Joe, actually, I talked to him about this. I, I told him I didn't completely disagree with a lot of his critiques. I think no one's really hit the home run yet. Uh, but I definitely think to your point, Chris, like we're just really begun with the space. Yeah, no. And th- something else that I had mentioned in my post, like the June is a multi-generational product in our house. My nine-year-old can read the cook programs and make pizza or the computer vision goes, hey, this is a pizza. Do you want to cook it? And he can make it, right? And he, I don't have to worry about him turning on an oven or leaving an oven on because it shuts down. And that's the same reason that my 70-plus-year-old parents bought a June is because they know once they're done with it, it's off. It's not they – don't, they don't leave it on. It doesn't get left on. Like they can – it's more controlled for them. And if they have a question about it, they can look it up on their phone and see like, oh, yes, I did. I did turn it off. So, you know, it, it's, it's got wide ranging appeal um, beyond just like it making really good chicken. And I think also there's just like core innovations that, that go beyond, hey, let's add an app and connectivity to it, right? I mean, well, it's taking a little while for um, these guys who are doing salt state cooking to get the products out the door because it's, it's pretty expensive to put these components into – the devices like there's an opportunity to like really recreate the microwave uh Miele showed off their product i think in uh maybe fall of 2017 uh basically their device that basically is a high precision microwave oven um we're still using microwave technology basically from world war ii um so think about cooking multiple things in a, in a cooking chamber at high precision and uh doing it at the same time i think that could be really interesting but also just also think about like rethinking kitchen design like once kitchens actually put intelligence into the fabric of the, the actual surfaces, once you have things like the wireless power consortium's key technology in your in your countertops, like there's just lots of stuff that it's going to be interesting to watch in innovation around the kitchen that goes beyond just like whether or not a cooking device is connected via an app. Yes, all of all of that. <laughs> Jen, do you cook much? And yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to. I was going to say. So I, I mean, in a lot of ways, I my thinking probably lines up a little bit more with Joe's, just because I love cooking. And by when I say I love cooking, I mean like that kitchen better be a disaster when I'm done. I better be up to my elbows in like ingredients that were flying around. Like I'm also kind of a weirdo in that I enjoy the process of cleaning the kitchen up after making a huge mess in it. Um, You are a weirdo. Yes, I am a complete weirdo and I don't know why I have a job writing about food (laughs) tech. Um, (laughs) No, but um, 
Yeah, but that being said, you know, I think, you know, I work from home. I do not at present have children. I have a lot of things in my life that allow me to experiment with something and take six hours to make ribs or, you know, make bread every week or, you know, do these sort of more manual guesswork sorts of uh, cooking experiments because that's just, you know, the context of my life allows for that. And I don't, I don't really know Joe, so I can't speak to his, but um, it does sound like he's pretty into cooking and probably sort of approaches it like an experience like I do. Um, You know, I think Chris makes a really good point though. If you don't like to cook or if you just need a little bit more assistance or you don't have time to, you know, a lot of people don't have four hours to guess on a recipe and see if it's going to turn out. And then, you know, what do you do if it doesn't, if you've got three kids waiting for dinner to be served? So I absolutely get that. I think what I, I think what I would really love to see is to your point about food waste, Mike, uh, because definitely I know that some of the ways that this more manual approach to cooking that I like probably wastes a significant, uh, probably wastes more food than would be if I were using a smart cooking device to help. Um, So I think it'll be interesting to see how, as the smart kitchen evolves, um, because Chris, I don't remember if it was you or Joe or both of you, uh, just sort of as it evolves from this tech for the sake of tech to tech that actually is something everybody is going to use and on a regular basis in their kitchens. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thoughts. And, you know, you mentioned food waste and, and cooking, you know, there are some platforms out there. There's some apps out there that are actually taking, uh, what you have in your refrigerator and instantly creating recipes Mm -hmm. or flavor pairings that allow you to cook to that. So even if it's so simple as like, Hey, I have this in my refrigerator. Um, I don't have anything else. Tell me what I can make. I think that's valuable. That's something that probably could, where technology could power some things. Um, but I, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes. But I'm also excited to have Joe on stage. We're going to actually be talking about this at the Smart Kitchen Summit. So if you want to see Joe and I uh, wrestle feats of strength, uh, or maybe I just like talk about, <laughs> maybe just talk about this. <laughs> Roman. And I actually, uh, Joe's great. We're going to have a conversation about this. I want to get his opinions and, and let him, let him air his grievances. So that'll be fun. But speaking of innovation in the kitchen, uh, real quickly, uh, you're actually heading down to Amazon tomorrow, Chris. There's a, a press conference. I know. It's exciting. Last year, you may remember around this time last year, Amazon introduced a slew of things, including the uh, Alexa powered microwave. Uh, the connect kit. I have my a word keeps turning on whenever I say that. Uh, the home connect. What was it? Connect kit. What was it connect called? Kit. Mike? Connect basically kit, connect so. kit. Building uh, Alexa into your appliances with a little bit of more uh, than just software. They actually had some chipsets in there. So yeah, that was their yeah. their their platform for Alexa. There, uh, there that, and then they had the clock, which they took. I think they discontinued for a while. I don't know if they came back. Uh, and a whole host of devices. So we're gonna. I'm sure that tomorrow is gonna be. Uh, packed with news. Hopefully we'll have a bunch of, you know, kitchen related news in there. Uh, I'm excited for it. I am uh, going to go ahead and start. I'm going to go to bed now so I can rest <laughs> up uh, we're, to write. We up were trying to strategize here. with you, with Chris, before the, before this podcast saying, Hey, how can we get the stuff you're learning up on the site? So we're going to try and figure that out. You're going to be busy there because it's, it's like an all day event. It is like an all day <laughs> event. Like a- I was talking with a friend of the show, Stacy Higginbotham, who's going, and uh, I was like, hey, when is when is this thinking that it would be like from 10 to noon? And she was like, no, it's 10 to five. And I was like, yeah. oh, my goodness gracious. That is a long day at yeah. Amazon. That's you might as well just spend, spend the night down there. It's, it's, like, you're going on a, it's like you're going on an Amazon cruise. <laughs> there it is. Uh, yeah. Well, and it's also right by the Amazon Go store. So I'm sure going to I'm probably, you know, caffeinate up pretty well before heading in. Well, we're excited. Um, I'm excited to see both you guys in a couple weeks at Smart Kitchen Summit. Uh, quick plug, smartkitchensummit.com. Use discount code podcast for 25% off. Check out the website. We have the agenda up. Like it's like we have this really great agenda. Um, guys, I, I don't know if you, you're looking to take meetings there, but we're also going to be using a networking app called Brella. So if you're going to ask us, you can actually meet with the people at the event, find out who's going. So I would suggest you guys check it out. Um, Chris, are you taking meetings at SKS? I'll t- I'll meet with anybody. Come by, say hi. I'll talk with you. 
What do you want? Gen- what do you want to talk about? <laughs> you want to talk about cashier the checkout? You want to talk about robots? I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> you guys will be busy on stage and writing too. But if, if you can take some meetings, great. But uh, thanks guys for joining me for the podcast. Uh, Chris, good luck tomorrow, and hope hope Catherine, if you're listening, you feel better. And uh, Jen, why don't you go mess up your kitchen a little bit? Oh yes, I will. There it is. <laughs> thanks, All right, Mike. Guys. All, All right, right, bye. Bye, guys. Bye.